Bueno, os presento a Stephanie Moraes, que es, bueno, es estudiante de doctorado de la Universidad de Sao Paulo. Eh, está ya finalizando la, este año la, la tesis doctoral y bueno, ahora este año nos está visitando desde el noviembre del año pasado y gracias a un acuerdo de doctorado de nuestra universidad con la Universidad de, de Sao Paulo, pues también es estudiante de doctorado de, del programa EOMA. Y bueno, este, hoy nos va a hablar de un, de un trabajo que, que hizo anteriormente a, a esta visita, que hizo en Sao Paulo, eh, que trata sobre la hiperbolicidad de los puntos de equilibrio de un problema no local y que, bueno, está a punto de ser publicado en la revista Journal of Differential Equation, que es una revista muy prestigiosa de, dentro de las matemáticas. Eh, así que, bueno, le doy la palabra a Estefaní. Muchas gracias, profesor, por, por la presentación. Eh, antes de empezar, bueno, yo quiero dar las gracias a, primero por la invitación al profesor José Valero y por, para los organizadores. Y también quiero agradecer a las personas del CEO, porque desde que he llegado en noviembre, las personas aquí han sido muy amables conmigo. Entonces, muchas gracias. Y bueno, entonces voy a empezar. Eh, uh, ahora voy a hablar en inglés. So, today I will talk about the concept of hyperbolicity for a non-local quasi-linear problem. So, this talk will be based on this work that I did with Professor Alexandre Carvalho. Uh, he is my advisor in Brazil. Okay. And, but before I start, I want to give you a motivation about the idea of, of hyperbolicity. And for that, I will consider this ODE here. So we are working in R2. And we can see that 0, 0 is a solution of this ODE. And it's a solution that we usually call an equilibrium, which means it's a solution that does not depend on time. So this will mean equilibrium for us. So 0 is a solution of this problem. This example I took from this book here, and the behavior of this ODE near the equilibrium is like that. So what we can see near the equilibrium? We have a decomposition of the space for which we have a di direction which solutions goes away from zero. So in this direction here, solutions goes away from zero as time goes to plus infinite. But we have another direction for which solutions goes to zero as t goes to plus infinite. And in any other direction, Solutions can approximate zero, but does not converge to zero. So it's a very particular characteristic, which we usually call settle point property, or more generally, hyperbolicity. And what we have, solutions near zero, zero, for this problem, uh, behaves almost very, very similar to this linear problem. So if we are able to look very close to zero in a small neighborhood, we can see that this problem behaves very, very similar with this linear problem. So here is the representation of this, of the sub neighborhood of zero for this problem here. So they have a very similar characteristic near the equilibrium. So it's a local problem. So we may find information for this problem here by looking to a linear problem. And now, today I will talk about this problem here. So now we have a PTE, so we have a dependence on time, and we also have a dependence on space. So here x will be between 0 pi. Now we are working since we have these two dependencies, now we are working in the function spaces. And what we have for this problem? So this A here, it's a C1 global ellipsis function, non-decreasing, take values in a bounded set, which is far from zero. And this lambda here is a parameter. And this F is a non-linearity that satisfies these properties here. So we will assume that f is c2, we assume this and this, and we also will ask f to be odd, what means that we have this property here. And this norm here represents the L2 norm. 
So we have this. So this denotes that integral. Okay, usually you may think of f as this function here. So f is similar to this function. Okay. So we are able to show that our problem defines a semigroup. What that means? We may define a family like that, given a solution of our problem. The solution that starts at zero, we can evolve until time t, and we define t of t of u equal this solution that is starts at u zero at time t. And with that, we have a family of semigroup in C1. What that means? That means that t of zero will be the identity, and the composition of these two operators will be this operator, this map, necessary operator, this map. And we will also have continuity uh, related to these two parameters, uh, these two variables, okay? So our problem here, we have global solutions, we have continuity between related to initial conditions. So we have a semigroup. And also this semigroup, it's what we call gradient. We find a Lyapunov function related to it. The Lyapunov function is this one. And what is the advantage of that? Basically, because since we have this Lyapunov function, we know that if you understand the set of equilibria, that is the set of solutions that does not depend on time, so solutions that satisfies this, what we have? We have a certain characteristics for gradient semigroups. Okay, so in this case, it's very important to understand the set of equilibria. And joined with Professor Alexandre, Yanali, and Tito Luna, we have shown that our problem, if we are assuming the, that it is non decreasing, has a finite number of equilibria. And to be more precise, we have shown that this number of equilibria depends on the parameter. So we have a bifurcation sequence. So as the parameter lambda increases, uh, it may appear equilibrium from zero. And it will be like that. If lambda is between these two values here, for some n natural, we will find two n plus one equilibria. So a set like that. So we have functions that comes from zero pi two r, which does not, which will be solutions that does not depend on time. And these functions here, phi j, phi j plus and phi j minus, have j plus one zero and zero pi. These will be the opposite of this. And phi j plus of x is equal zero in, is greater than zero in this super interval. So how is that? Basically, for n lambda, zero will be an equilibrium. If lambda is greater than a zero, then we will find a positive equilibrium like that. It's zero only zero pi. In the negative, which will be the opposite. And if lambda is greater than a zero to a square, we will find another two equilibrium, one that behaves like that and its opposite. And so on. If lambda is greater than a zero three square, we find an equilibrium like that, and so on. But the equilibrium will be will appear in pair as the parameter increases, and they have a lot of symmetries, as the, you can imagine for the the picture. And our problem also admits a global attractor. What that means? That means that we find a compact for which the evolution, that is t of t of a for all t is equal a of a. So if we evolve solutions that starts in this in the set, we have the set. So it does not we do not deform the set. And this compact has a very nice property that given a bounded set for all bounded set, we have that the solutions that it starts in this bottom set will converge to this compact as time goes to plus infinity. And understanding the attractor is understanding the dynamics of the ordinary system.
And what is the relation with the equilibrium and the attractor? Basically, in our situation, since we have a gradient structure, and we also have a finite number of equilibria, we have this characterization here. So A will be a finite unit of sets like that. And this set, which you usually call a stable manifold of E, is given by that. So it's the set of U and H10 for which we find a solution that is starts at U, uh, G of zero is equal U, and converts to phi as c goes to minus infinity. And for more information and details about semi-groups and attractor, I recommend this reference here. Okay, so why do you study hyperbolism of equilibrium? Basically, I put here four points. In order to understand the syntactic behavior of our dynamical system, and in the search of the structure of the attractor, these two are very related. And in maybe it could help us to obtain the Hausdorff dimension of the attractor, which, what could be useful, which could be useful somehow. And the most important reason is that hyperbolicity is a concept of robust standard perturbation. That means if we have that for a problem, an equilibrium which is hyperbolic, for problems which are closed, in some sense, we will, we will also have this structure. So it's a very nice problem. Okay. And in what context do we, do we, do we study hyperbolism? Well, usually we are working in a Hubert space. Uh, so we have a here, a linear operator with a self adjoint with compact resolvent. So we are assuming here that A satisfies this, and we find some lambda greater than zero for which this operator, the inverse of lambda E minus A, is well defined and is actually compact. That means the image of bounded subset is a, is a pre compact set. And this f here will be a function that leaves an open set in a more regular space and goes to x, is locally Lipschitz, which means we have this for a r when we have this limitation. So, suppose, for instance, that phi is an equilibrium for this problem here. We can show that, as in the first ODE, the example that I have shown, it is also true that solutions of three close to phi behave similarly to solutions of some linear problem. This problem here. And to be more precise, if I consider L like this operator, what we have, we can define sets, the resolvent, this whole lambda, the resolvent, is a set of complex number for which this inverse is well defined, and this number here is finite. And the spectrum will be the complementary, which in our case is basically the set of complex number, complex numbers for which we find a function which is non zero in the domain of A, and that satisfies this. Uh, I just want to observe that this equality here, this last equality, it's not true in general situations. In my case, it is true. But in more general context, we only have this inclusion. So this set here is inside the spectrum. Okay. If you assume that this spectrum does not intersect the imaginary axis, it's basically that. What we have, or in our case, if zero does not belong to the spectrum. So in this situation, for the linear problem, so for L, what we have? We have a decomposition of the space and we have projections. And using that knowledge for the linear, we have this result here. Uh, please do not be scared. <laughs> It's uh, basically this theorem, I'm, 
is saying we find a region that converts to the equilibrium to our phi for so we found a set of points that converts to our equilibrium and we find a set of points that converts backwards to the equilibrium but in some sense basically i can show you by this picture if the spectrum if zero does not belong to the spectrum what we have for the linear problem we have a decomposition of the space so here we have zero and we decompose the space in two parts and in this direction we have that solutions goes to zero as t goes to plus infinite and in this direction the solutions leave zero and the interesting thing is that for the same linear problem we have some similar behavior so although it's the direction is given by a curve now so it's not exactly this one we have some similar behavior so we find some u and you find some s for which in this u solution goes away from from zero as c goes to plus infinite and in this s solutions goes to zero as c goes to plus infinite and then the other direction what we have solutions can approximate our equilibrium but lives away so basically what i'm saying here is that this previous theorem assured us that understanding the semi-linear problem uh, can be made by understanding the linear problem related to it, to it. So, close to the equilibrium, so this is a local problem, these problems behave similarly. Okay, now you may think, if this our problem fit the usual approach, and actually, we cannot do that because, first of all, our problem is not semi-linear. What this means? This means that we have this term here that multiplies the Laplacian. So this is the principal part of the equation, and this, and it's not linear. So our problem is what we call usually quasi-linear. And since we have the dependence of the all, the dependence on the all interval, what our problem is also non local. This makes things a little difficult. So we cannot use the usual approach because since we have these properties, our problem is not, is not locally close to a linear problem. So we cannot study close to the equilibrium by studying a linear problem which is close to our problem. This does not happen. So we need to define a new comp concept of hyperbolism that is more general, but has a accordance with the traditional concept. Okay, so now I will present the definition. So first, what we will mean to be topological hyper, topologically hyperbolic? Phi is said to be topologically hyperbolic if this set it, it is an isolated invariant set. That means first, phi is an equilibrium, and we actually find the neighborhood of the equilibrium for which phi is the only global solution in this neighborhood. So for any global solution inside this neighborhood, necessarily we conclude that this solution is phi. So any solution inside this neighborhood must live at some, at some time or need to come from outside. So we cannot find any global solution that is same in this neighborhood for all time. And having the concept of topologically hyperbolic, we are able to define the local stable and local unstable sets of phi. So since we have a delta neighborhood that satisfies this property, we can define the stable, the local stable manifold as the set of U's such that the solution that starts at U for all time, for all possible times, 
is safe, always in this neighborhood. And actually, this evolution converts to feel as it goes to plus infinity. So it's a set of points for which solution goes to the equilibrium. And the unstable, the local unstable set will be the set of U for which we can find a global solution with T of zero equal U backwards. This global solution is inside this neighborhood for all T uh, less than or less than or equal zero. And actually, this solution converts to the equilibrium as time goes to minus infinity. And we have a particular case. We could have, for instance, that this set could be only the equilibrium. And in this particular case, that this set is only the equilibrium, we say that phi is syntactically stable. Otherwise, phi is unstable. And strictly hyperbolist, what will mean? Phi will be hyperbolic. If we can, if we can decompose the space in two parts, so in a direct sum, and we have that phi is topologically hyperbolic, and we find the Lipschitz function, so a function comes from a subspace to another, and another comes from this subspace to the other, and these Lipschitz functions have constants less than one, satisfy this, and basically what I'm saying here is that these sets that I have defined, they can be seen as graphs of these Lipschitz functions. This will be hyperbolic. Okay, with these concepts in mind, we have the following theorem. So the sequence of bifurcation that uh, we construct early satisfies this. So if lambda is less than or equal to zero, zero will be the only equilibrium. And in that case, zero will be stable. Otherwise, if the lambda is greater than a zero, the positive equilibrium and the negative one will be stable and the others will be unstable. But anyhow, all the equilibrium will be hyperbolic with the exception of zero in the cases lambda equal a zero and square, the moments for which we have the bifurcations. So in this talk, I want to give an idea about that part here. How to prove this. In order to do that, I will consider this auxiliary problem. So this problem here, instead of a being here, a is, divide, a is divided in the nonlinear part. And this problem here is globally well posed. The solutions are jointly continuous with respect to time and initial conditions. So we have a semi group related to it. And we have also a very nice thing. If we consider a change of variable in the time variable, what we have. So if we define T, given a solution of this problem, a solution of W, if we define T like that, we are able to construct a solution new for the quasi-linear problem. So we have this nice, nice relation. Given a solution here, we construct a solution for our original problem. And actually, you can do the opposite too. Given a solution of the quasi-linear problem, we are able to construct a solution for the semi-linear problem. In particular, what we have, since the, the problems are related by a change in the time variable, they share the same equilibrium because it, an equilibrium does not depend on time. So if phi is an equilibrium of the quasi-linear, it is also an equilibrium for the semi-linear problem. So what we thought? Well, this quasi-linear problem we cannot approach by the traditional theory, but this problem we can. So we thought maybe we can prove informations of a hyperbolic for this problem. And so we have a semi-linear problem and we talk about linearization. See if we are able to understand the linear problem close to the semi-linear problem and then passing the information of the semi-linear to the quasi-linear. 
this is not this is not trivial because this change of variables here depends on its solution so it's not uniform so this is not direct we do not have a direct connection between these problems okay but this we will work so we are able to find answers for this semilinear problem and pass information for the quasi linear i will try to give an idea about that but since this is a semilinear problem, we have that close to the equilibrium, this problem behaves similarly to a linear problem. And this problem we usually call linearization. And we will be given by that. So the semilinear problem is close to this problem here, where L is given by that. And hyperbolicity of equilibrium for the semilinear is proved if we are able to show that this operator here, that zero does not belong to this operator. Basically, L if L is injected. Well, let's, let's start with the easy, easier one, which be when phi is identically zero. When phi is identically zero, since we have this, we are assuming this, what do we have? This operator here, this part will disappear, and this is basically one. So we have that the linearization at zero is given by that. And this spectrum we know, uh, it's a spectrum, and is given by this set here. So in the case when lambda is less than a zero, all the eigenvalues are negative. That means, for the semilinear problem, we find a neighborhood of zero, so an open ball that contains zero, and constants in constants k and beta, in a way that each solution is starting, that starts in this neighborhood, it stays close to zero. Actually, we have even more. We have that, we have an exponential decay. So every solution that starts in the neighborhood goes to zero as m goes to plus infinity. Since we have a relation between the semilinear and the quasi-linear, we, what we have, we can, we are able to show that each solution of the quasi-linear problem that is starts at this point, since it is equal to some w, solution of the semilinear, satisfies this exponential decay. It's not the same because now we, the variable it's, it's another, is C, not tau, but we also have an exponential decay. So because of that, we, are, we have proved that zero will be exponentially stable and hyperbolic in that case. When lambda is different from a zero in a square and lambda is greater than a zero, what do we have? Zero will be unstable. And we, what this means? This means that we find a global solution for which we have the following. The initial condition is very close to zero, so it is small. And this global solution, when at a, when tau, when tau is equal to zero is equal to u zero. And backwards, this solution is also a small and we have this control. So this solution, basically this, is from, this solution, decays exponentially to zero as tau goes to minus infinity. Since again, we have a relation between solutions of the semilinear and the quasi-linear. If we define T of T like that, T will be a solution of the quasi-linear for which we have an exponential decay backwards. So the, what I'm saying here, I'm saying that this stable and unstable manifolds of the quasi-linear and the semi-linear coincide. And we actually have more, we have that one in one part, we have exponential decay forwards. In another part, we have an exponential decay backwards. Now things will be a little more difficult. 
when we talk about hyperbolic for phi not equal zero, this is more challenging because we need to understand the oper operator like that. And this term here makes things a little more difficult. So, define a family of operators for each var epsilon. We define this operator, L var epsilon. So, this operator here can be decomposed as this part plus this part here, where L0 is given by that, and BU is this term here. So, what we have? For this first part, this operator here is of a joint with compact resolvent, and it's actually a very well known operator because it has a particular form, which, which we usually call strongly read operator. That means the spectrum, this set here, can be written like that, where we have this. So, which eigenvalue? Each number here will be simple. So, and we also have another nice property. That is, we find an eigenfunction uk related to lambda k that has k plus one zero and zero pi. And in our particular case, we also have this symmetry for this p here. As a consequence, these eigenfunctions also are symmetric or anti-symmetric in zero pi. So for more details about operators, which are strongly beam, I recommend this reference here. But in our situation, we need to understand not the strongly beam operator, we need to understand this operator here. And what we have for this operator, we also can write this section as this. And it's very nice because we have that we can uh, name them in a way that we, these functions here, this will be a function, v of j bar epsilon will be a function, which will be continuous and actually non-decreasing. So this index here came from the fact that mi j of zero will be lambda j where lambda j will be the, the again, value of this problem here. So we can ordinate these again, again values in a way that we have continuous functions for each j that satisfies this. And we also have more, we have that for a fixed bar epsilon, these, these again values here, they have a most multiplicity too, and they will be simple if they does not coincide with the spectrum of L0. So this is very nice. So V of J is simple if does not belong to the spectrum of L0. So it does not belong to this set. Well, this is an example to give an idea of how these curves behaves. So the red lines, the red curves represent represents the paths, the curves of the eigenvalues. So this will be our mi j's. So epsilon is here. Lambda here denotes the position of the eigenvalues. So if we cross an horizontal line here, we'll, the intersection of this horizontal line will be the eigenvalues of L epsilon for this particular epsilon where the horizontal line touch here. For example, when where epsilon is equal to zero, so this intersection of this horizontal line with the red lines will be the eigenvalues of L0. So these will these are the eigenvalues of L0. Uh, before I made the analysis, the analysis of our problem, we need some pre preliminary result. So, if you consider phi solution of this problem here, but in some subinterval, 0R, 
And this norm here is given by that, okay? From zero to R. What we have? We have a lemma that I will call key, key lemma that says to us that the linearization related to this problem, so this one, satisfies the following. If this phi is the positive solution in zero R, so is the positive solution for this problem here. What we have, this operator has only negative eigenvalues. If phi has some zero in zero R, this operator has at least one positive eigenvalue. But anyhow, we can say that zero is always in the resolvent of this operator. So this operator will be injected for all phi, not equal zero. So the first part is to show that uh, with that assumption, A is not decreasing, we have that the first equilibria, which is the positive one, is exponentially stable and consequently hyperbolic. And the idea of doing that is basically using these two things. First, because of the dilemma, this, li this linearization, the positive equilibria, has only negative eigenvalues. And the linearization for our problem is given by that. And this epsilon 1 is a negative value, or less than or equal to 0. So we use the monotonicity that we have of this curve of eigenvalues, and we are able to conclude that phi 1 is exponentially stable. OK. But what about the other ones? The equilibria that change sign. Ah, I just want to observe one thing here. We, I'm saying here Q1, I'm saying about the positive equilibrium, but this is also true for the negative equilibrium because the analysis will be the same because this operator here is the same when we are considering Q1 plus or we are considering Q1 minus. And this is true for the other cases. That's why I'm denoting like that, okay? So in order to talk about hyperbolicity of the other equilibrium, we need to do, divide in steps. So what we need to prove? We need to prove that zero does not belong to the spectrum of these operators. Let's do just the first case. So I will assume that phi2 is the positive one because the negative one is an hour. So the linearization is given by that. I want to prove that zero does not belong to the spectrum. So how do I do that? Basically, I will argue by contradiction. I will assume that zero is an eigenvalue. So this operator is not injected. So I find some V for which we have this. But the simplicity of the eigenvalue implies that this V is antisymmetric, which in particular, if we consider X equal pi over two, we are able to conclude that V of pi over two is zero. But that means that the restriction U, the restriction of V to zero pi, satisfies this, uh, this is true for the restriction for some particular epsilon 2. So that means for that we are able to construct an operator in 0 pi over 2 in a way that 0 belongs to the spectrum of this operator. But that will leave us to, will give us a contradiction because we can relate this problem to M0. And if this is true, M0, that the case when this is zero, will have some positive eigenvalue, which could not be true because of the dilemma, because M0 corresponds to the linearization of this problem in the first equilibrium, the positive equilibrium because the restriction of it to, to zero pi will be the positive equilibrium of this problem. So we have a contradiction. Because of that, 
we have that v of 2 must be hyperbolic. Okay, and when we are considering phi j for j odd. So, again, we will argue about contradiction. We will assume that this is not true. So, we we'll find some u, which is not, not zero, and such that we have this. So, L is not injective. So, we are able to find some u that satisfies this. But again, by the simplicity of the eigenvalue, this u necessarily will be symmetric. So now we divide in two cases. Either me pi over j is equal to zero or it isn't. In this first case, we are able to show that this u here must be the same symmetries that phi j has. But in that situation, what it means? It means that we can restrict ourselves to this three interval and this restriction will satisfy this problem here. So it's a, it's a solution of this. And this, by the same reason and applied to J, J equal 2, does not, does not happen. So we have a contradiction. So this case is the simpler one, the simplest one. Now this is the difficult case when b pi over j is not equal to u. So we have some u that we are assuming the existence of some u and we are assuming that at this point pi over j this is not equal to zero and we define two other functions u1 and u2. Basically, the idea is here below. So we imagine that j is equal to 3 and this is our, our u. The idea is we have this function. What we do, this u1 is basically we translate. Uh, you, we take this part and we start at this part. And then this other, this other part we glue here below. And u2 is basically the reflection of this in, in x equal pi over 2. So we have here. So given a new, we are able to construct u1 and u2. And they are different from each other. And since we have this u1, u, u1 and u2, we are able to define v1 and v2 which will be solutions of this or the And observe that phi prime is also a solution of this or So we have three solutions of this problem, of this equation. So let's prove that V1 and V2 defines a fundamental set of solutions, which will imply that V prime is a linear combination of U1 and V2. Okay, so how we prove the, that? We are by contradiction again. So we assume that this is not a fundamental set. So we can assume that v1 is equal to alpha v2. But we are able to prove that alpha is equal to minus 1. And th that gives us this equality here. And this equality here, we, if we compute this equality at this point here, we obtain a relation, that one, which gives us to an homogeneous system, this. So with this relation, we have this system here, L of u is equal to zero. So where L is this matrix and u is equal to this matrix. So if this matrix is invertible, we should conclude that this vector here is ident identically zero. But this cannot happen because we were assuming that this first point, it's not zero, right? But the thing is, this determinant is different from zero, so this is invertible, which would imply that each of these points should be zero, which is a contradiction. So this proves that v1 and v2 
defines a fundamental set of solutions. Because of that, TJ prime satisfies this. Since Vj is always symmetric, Vj prime has some anti-symmetries and symmetric properties. So we have this. But this and this give, give us another relation. And with that relation, we also are able to construct an homogeneous system, this one. Well, this vector here, it's not zero, right? Because we are assuming that this is different from zero. But again, we will prove that this matrix is non singular, which will give us a contradiction. So, in fact, we have this lemma here that this matrix always has this determinant. So, it's not zero for n, n. For n, n, n. So, consequently, we have a contradiction again because this would imply that u of p over j is equal to zero, which is not true. Which means that we eliminate all the possibilities of the existence of u, which means that zero does not belong to this spectrum. Therefore, when j is odd, phi of j is hyperbolic. But when phi of j, uh, but when we have phi j for j even, well, basically what we do, we use symmetry properties in order to reduce our problem to a superinterval. And this superinterval will be uh, will be some problem which which belongs to we, we can apply the same idea of the previous case in order to conclude that zero belongs to the resolvent, which means that zero does not belong to this spectrum of this operator. So that's it. I hope I was able to convince you that we have this result here. Hyperbolic of all equilibria with the exception of zero for these cases. And this is a basic reference if anyone wants to look. These two articles are very important and they play an important role in my article because they give us an idea about the spectral analysis when we have this new local term. And this is a basic reference on the area. This work here uh, was the article where we made the existence of the bifurcation sequence. And that's it. Thank you very much. Gracias. Muito obrigada. <laughs> Gracias. Okay, so my question is about, uh, okay, you are using transform equation in order to prove the hyperbolicity. So you have, you have proved that in the transform equation, the spectrum zero is not in the spectrum, okay? But my mm -hmm. question is, when you come back to the original equation, this is uh, straightforward to obtain hyperbolicity or you have to do something? Uh, Basically, we are able to show that the stable manifold and the unstable manifold coincides because of this relation. But in order to do that, it's very important that we have this condition here. Uh, this is not possible, for example, if we not consider that case. We need to uh, we we need to have a bound, a low bound for A, and the upper bound for A. So. Mm -hmm. We are able to do that because we have this. So, although the change of variable is not uniform, we have some control on it. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if I answered your question. So. Okay, thank you. Gracias y un saludo a todos. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.